Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to Grand Rounds. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and uh, also please uh, fill out and turn in the program evaluations that you picked up on the way in. Uh, today it's my pleasure to uh, actually reintroduce Dr. Selden Spencer. Dr. Spencer is board certified uh, by the Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and is also certified in uh, polysomnography and neurosynology, and he's a uh, frequent contributor at Grand Rounds, and he is back today to update us with or on uh, pain with attention to headache. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Spencer. Good morning, or afternoon, and uh, thanks for being here. Let me uh, explain that kind of like every time you do a talk, it all of a sudden starts to expand and get bigger and bigger. So this is part one. You can't hear me? Or you can't? We're okay. It, so this is part one, and actually would be more directed toward the whole concept of pain and thoughts about pain, but less that you uh, gnash your teeth and rent your clothes and throw things at me, I'll tell you the punchline for a headache, okay? So that's all you want to know about anyway. The three things that I'm going to talk about and headache at the end of the month, which will be July 29th, is first the interest now in biomarkers for headache and particularly migraine, both in terms of uh, neuroimaging and in terms of uh, uh, chemistry. And the chemistry really revolves around a peptide that's been around for a long time called calcitonin gene-related peptides. And uh, hold on to your horses because there are three pharmaceutical companies that are now in phase three trials with antibodies to calcitonin gene-related peptide. And the phase two trials all show that it works. So I assure you in the next year or two, uh, you'll be seeing on TV these very uh, imaginatively named drugs that will relieve your patients of migraine. Migraine is to be distinguished from headache, although that's an ongoing discussion in our department. The last thing is, as far as a practical matter in uh, headache management, it turns out, at least as good as the epidemiology can be, that the most important thing we can do for our patients with migraine is to be able to evolve and arrive at effective abortive treatment. The best predictor of somebody going from episodic migraine, episodic headache to chronic daily headaches and very much disabled condition is the inability to control the episodic headache very well. So a person that winds up getting their migraine and going on for eight hours or 24 hours is far more likely to get into chronic daily headaches, which is a bad condition. Uh, than somebody who can take their drug and get better within an hour or two. Okay, so now this is going to be a little bit more talking about just pain, and um, I thought it's very relevant to headache, so I thought we needed to get the background down first. And so what I intend to talk about is uh, some of the neuroscience of pain, uh, and then a few pain syndromes, and then a... <laughs> perhaps uh, um, some case histories, some of which are rather cathartic for me, but anyway, I hope they will be useful to all of us to think about pain problems. And then when you come back on the 29th, we'll do more about headache epidemiology and diagnosis and treatment. So a lot of page or two, oh, there's one thing I do want you to do. We never ask the audience to do anything. And I'm gonna ask you to do something because I think it's kind of cute and clever and I'll come to it at the very end which is I want you to take your pencil and write on your handout two arrows, two arrows. And so I'll kind of tweak in your mind, and you'll think, well, what the heck is that all about? But we'll talk about it at the very end. I think it's kind of interesting. So um, some, there is such a thing as the International Association for the Study of Pain. They provide a definition. Uh, the actual word pain means penalty. But here are some of the numbers that we have to contend with. The Institute of, Med of Medicine in 2014, huge number, 100 million patients, and I think it's more of a prevalence kind of number than it is a uh, incidence number. But regardless, a lot of people with dealing with chronic pain in one sort or another. Uh, this article from the Cl Mayo Clinic Proceedings, very recent, um, is uh, very 
thorough, um, and I thought the number of 3% of our gross domestic product going to the treatment and uh, care of pain is a, a big number and something that we should attend to. Um, I guess I'm kind of a fan of Descartes because he was the one that really kind of designed the sensory system that we think about. And what we're going to go through is a lot of what Descartes laid out, but it's now more refined. But we're going to get into what my favorite thing is, is a lot to do with the brain and how the brain handles the whole sensory input and management. And it's always a, a chore in the office. People are talking about their pain, they're talking about their hand, they're talking about their foot, and then you start talking about, you know, their depression and things of that sort. They say, well, you know, Doc, do you think this is all in my head? Of course it's in your head. I mean, where else are you going to experience? You take the head off, you don't have pain. So, yes, you, you know, your brain has a role in the perception of pain. And so this is the woodcut from the 1600s, and uh, the guy gets his toe burnt, and Descartes decided that it goes up the leg into the spinal cord to the brain. Um, so we got to parse this apart. We talk about receptors, talk about the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, talk about subcortical nuclei, and then about the cortex itself. That part I'm going to cover nicely. The neurophysiology I'm going to kind of skim a little bit more. And this is the thing whether we're talking about headaches or whether we're talking about foot pain, you got to keep the basic circuit in mind. And I, I think we're all very good about the afferent input that if we have sensation going into the dorsal horn and going across up into the brain, but what we ignore a lot is the very nice hardwired descending inhibitory circuit. And we do not have a good way of measuring that inhibitory circuit, but that periaqueductal gray down to the dorsal horn I think it's very key to our understanding of what our patients are experiencing in pain and why we do or do not do a very good job with that. So um, I'm not going to beat you to death, but these are a variety of different nerve endings out there. The thing that you want to take away from this, and I'll show you in a picture, is that some of the fibers have very fast action, some of the fibers are very slow. So myelinated, not myelinated. And it's the unmyelinated, these polymodal C fibers are the ones that are the bad actors that really create the chronic experience of pain. So here's a graphic that kind of shows that you have a thermos receptor saying, yeah, hmm, there's a hot light on my finger and it's sending a message in and it just stays the same. Yep, yep, it's just there, it's there, it's there. But you also have these very fine fibers that are pain receptors that will then really make a noise slowly, as you can see down here, they send the signal and it gets louder and louder, and that is summated here. There's the nociceptor sending its message in, and the summated uh, signal to the brain is really largely coming from the nociceptor at the end. So this is the rubber meets the road, and you have your different kind of receptors out there, and this is the ones, these very primitive uh, fine fibers that lay out on our skin uh, are characteristic of nociceptors. And again, to emphasize that the difference between a myelinated fiber and the C fiber will express a lot of what your brain eventually perceives. And again, you can do the experiment very quickly, you're going to get that emission, oh, it's going to come from the myelinated fiber, and that's that nice high tall signal here. <clears throat> Whereas if you are blocking that myelinated fiber, all you're going to get is this dull roar that builds up and builds up. And when your patients talk about their pain and they talk about dull pain, achy pain, that's probably more nociceptive type of uh, input. Um, and then if you block it, you just get the acute process. Getting into the dorsal horn now, there's all these lamina and there's all this detail about it, but what I wanted to try and and they have a very precise wiring as far as influencing one another and having inner neurons influence one another. And even the ventral horn gets into the act. But perhaps, uh, yeah, I, so maybe I should pause to talk that we get into a problem with the peripheral fiber getting, uh, you hear the word 
sensitivity or super sensitivity. So the peripheral fibers can get into that, but it's also the dorsal horn that's highly involved in that. And in fact, some of the phantom pain stuff we're gonna talk about is probably more of a dorsal horn phenomenon. So hypersensitivity in the dorsal horn um, is uh, one of the maladaptive experiences in pain. Now this is going north into the brain, and this is pretty simple. I gave you all these long listed things, but I really like this picture because it breaks them apart into two processes. So remember, we got our information coming into the spinal cord, and it's going to go to the brain. There's a neospinal thalamic, which is very precise. If you wish, that would be your myelinated message. That's getting up to the brain very nicely. Whereas we have all these paleospinal elements, and there's a big difference between these two pictures. Not only is this slow-mo getting into the brain, this is the only system that's tied in with, with the periaqueductal gray. Again, periaqueductal gray being that inhibitory uh, experience to pain. And one of the case histories will be a good, good story about that, I think. Um, the spinal thalamic uh, neospinal doesn't do that at all. So triggering the inhibitory circuit is requiring these old systems. And you can break it apart pretty easily. The paleo, you're going to wake up. Oh, there's pain. Or you say, oh, there's a pain, there's a motion. Or, man, I'm starting to sweat. There's an uh, uh, autonomic response. And that's what the paleospinal system gives us. Now, I mentioned already the very great importance of the periactric ductal gray. Um, this is also important because it has everything to do with opiates. If you're going to give opiates, the opiates fire up the periactric ductal gray and causes the inhibitory experience of pain. You'd say, well, that's great. As we all know, opiates aren't very good. Um, opiates are transient in their benefit. And one of the problems with using opiates, which our own endogenous opiates come from the hypothalamus, but triggering the periaqueductal gray with opiates turns the periaqueductal gray off eventually. You see it start to wane in its benefit. These, these other elements that come in and then we talk a little bit about gait control theory. So here's my favorite buddy, the periaqueductal gray. And I should say it's around the aqueduct of Silvius right there. Um, gait control, I think probably everybody's heard about that somewhere along the way in physiology, but it's our own personal experience. And, you know, we, we touch a hot stove, we touch a skeleton, we jerk back. That's, that's fine. But then we shake the hand. And what are we doing with shaking the hand? we are trying to trigger those myelinated fibers to go override the C fiber. That's what that's all about. And that's what, and I don't want to be a shill for the physical therapist, but the physical therapist will use things like a TENS unit, and that is the mechanism of a TENS unit. It's trying to drive the myelinated fibers, the sensory fibers, to overcome the input of the C fibers. So I kind of beat, beat that to death already, but one thing now we got to talk about is out on the periphery what happens with inflammation. So pain characteristically or an injury is associated with the calor, rubor, dolor, tumor. So there's swelling, there's heat, there's redness, and that all bespeaks the inflammatory element of uh, the uh, injury. I mentioned, and I'll show you a picture with that, but uh, trying to address that and being aware of that is very important. And in fact, at the very end, you know, we're going to show pictures about uh, uh, complex regional pain syndromes, which is just calar, rubor, tumor going wild. Um, and trying to, and that's bound to be mediated more by bradykinin and things of that sort. So I mentioned already that the dorsal horn can become more active almost as a memory phenomenon, and there's some very elegant things to say about that, but it's a bad thing for our patients. And um, there's a lot about sodium channels, but at the end of the day, antem, amputation and phantom limb, and this is also true in the battlefield now, that they are becoming more and more aware that if there's a trauma in the battlefield trying to use anesthesia effectively directed at the dorsal horn will 
prevent the experience of phantom limb pain. So I'm not going to, as I said, I'm not going to do a lot on chemistry. As I already meant, there's a kind of a double-edged sword with opiates, and uh, they are taking advantage of our, national, our natural compensatory response to the periaqueductal gray, but it's a, it's a short candle. It doesn't work that well. Um, substance P and also the calcitonin gene-related peptide are more peripheral phenomenon. And I should say headache is not any different than your foot in the sense that you have a trigeminal ganglion and it goes into the brain and its dorsal column is the uh, nucleus caudalis in the brain stem. So the, the, the physiology is the same whether we're talking about the head or the foot um, in some respects. Now, so this is your picture. You have that C fiber out there and it gets injured somehow or another. It got burnt or it got pinched or something, and it releases all these other products which have the a natural uh, ability to recruit. And it's the recruitment that causes a great deal of problem as we go along. And uh, woe be tied me that I ignore other features. So I've been talking about neurons, neurons, but they do have their buddies, the astrocytes, and they do have their buddies, the microglia. And I will show you a, an article at the very end, again, kind of as a teaser, that uh, inflammation and immunological uh, behavior is very important for pain. All right, so I mentioned already how your reflex shaking the hand. If you put your hands in very cold water, it uh, actually burns, so the perception of heat is uh, quite a bit different. If you put a blood pressure or cough on, you control the myelinated fibers, you know, the experience of pain is quite different. And uh, those of you who have dealt with people with frontal lobe injuries, they have no emotional contact. I mean, they can hurt themselves one way or another, and there is no emotional experience with regards to pain. Um, finally, the other curious thing is the mirror synesthesia. And so I want to kind of, oh, okay, two slides talking about terminology, but also taxonomy. And we don't do any of this here. Maybe we should. But uh, the idea is uh, you can codify your pain patients in a, in a more precise way. But for our purpose, we, we need to have the terminology together, which is acute is less than three months, chronic is more than six months, Allodynia is a feather on a part of the skin and causes pain. That's allodynia, a benign stimulation leading to pain. Hyperalgesia just being noxious stimulation leading to exaggerated pain. And then uh, pain, persistent pain, there's no stimulation. The place just hurts. So again, this is the taxonomy of pain. Uh, I think I gave you the reference here. Yeah, that's very old. So something like carpal tunnel shouldn't be called carpal tunnel, it should be called 206 point X, you know, whatever. But anyway, just to know that there is somebody out there thinking about it. And if you think about it, our epidemiology for all these things is very poor because we don't do these kind of things. Um, that's certainly true for headaches. So again, refer you to some of the work by um, this in terms of trying to get an idea of incidence of different conditions. But I'm going to just talk about phantom limb and complex renal pain syndrome here at the very end. So this is uh, uh, phantom limb pain. And uh, two individuals, the top is uh, missing his left hand. And the gentleman down here is missing his left leg. And he has intense pain in that limb. The mirror synesthesia uh, is the uh, concept of having a mirror between the stump and the leg. And you can see, looking here, he looks down at his healthy right leg, and he sees his healthy left leg. You watch the videos of these, these things, and it's absolutely bizarre what the patients are telling you. They're saying, oh, man, that feels so good. They, ring, they roll their ankle around, and man, that makes my left leg feel so good. This is obviously a lot of remodeling going on in the brain, but it works, and it's an effective way to try and treat phantom limb pain. Um, and obviously there's a lot of cortical remapping. For instance, this person lost their 
hand, but it remapped twice on the biceps so they could touch their thumb on several different places. Complex regional pain syndrome, if the nerve is involved, it's called two, but there's just the numbers for you. Um, but this is a, a bad actor, and I think those of us who have been involved in these uh, cases um, uh, have bad memories of it. Um, I would tell you that the key is to, and that's in the literature too, is you jump on it full feet. If you have a crush injury in the foot and it didn't get better in a week, you have to go after it. And uh, what I learned as what used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy is that you remove the sympathetic input. That does not work. It's been shown over and over that sympathectomies do not help. Don't do a sympathectomy. Whereas trying to protect the bone and prevent the bone loss with biphosphonates and going at it with a lot of steroids, because as I told you before, I think it's a spread of the bradykininins and all the other neuroinflammatory elements on the periphery that really uh, cause misery in this case. And just in case you haven't seen it, it's just a swollen limb uh, or a hand. And uh, the features, if you want to try to remember a memnonic of that sort, but it's just remarkable that the hand is very cold, yet it's sweating, it's really gone haywire. And uh, you can treat it, and you need to take it seriously and not say, hey, it's going to get better, just leave it alone. Um, so now I'm going to have about three slides talking about the brain. And really, my motivation for doing this was this article by this guy, Apkarian, in 2013. And I thought this was really a seminal work. Um, and I hope you think it is. But I, I appreciate it hasn't gotten a lot of legs. So I'm going to cover some other things. And you got to go back over how the uh, cerebrum is behaving. So there are people that claim that the functional MRI can show you thermal or social pain through these nuclei, somatosensory cortex, periaqueductal gray, anterior cingulate, and the insular cortex. And he refers to this as the pain signature within the brain. Those are the features that you need to have. What this guy did, Apcarian, was not look at the nuclei, but rather look at the wires that connect the nuclei. And I'll go over this experiment in, in uh, a bit, because I think it's pretty interesting. After a while, you do see atrophy with chronic pain in certain parts of the brain. And the part of the brain that you see atrophy in is the nucleus accumbens and the medial prefrontal cortex. Now, you all remember from high school or college or medical school or wherever, the nucleus accumbens is your pleasure center. You know how you put the little probe in the nucleus accumbens and it's got a little wire and you teach the rat to press a bar in order to get the stimulation in the nucleus accumbens and the rat will do it all day, all night. He won't eat, he won't drink, he will die because he's stimulating his pain, his pleasure center. So there are these parts of the brain, and that withers away in chronic pain. And as I'll talk on these couple cases at the very end, I think our understanding of how the nucleus accumbens works or how to modify the nucleus accumbens is sorely lacking and maybe very relevant. So this is the Apcarian experiment, and you got to understand the idea of diffusion tensor imaging. That is the wires that are connecting the different hubs. Uh, we've talked about the connectomes, and these wires, these white matter fibers, can go haywire. The classic example would be the blast injuries that we see, the concussive injuries to the brain. You see the wires shred apart, and there's radio, and there's axial, and isotropy. Regardless, what he did very cleverly was take 46 people with new onset low back pain. How common is low back pain? Very common. And uh, over a year and a half, some half recovered, half didn't. And then he went and compared their brains that he looked at with the fractional anisotropy at the beginning of their low back pain. And at uh, a year out, some of them had gotten better. What's the difference between the people that got better and that didn't get better with their low back pain? Lo and behold, there is a difference. So what you see in people that didn't get better is that they had reduced fractional anisotropy, 
that the water diffusion in the white matter tracks particularly did not, um, in, was not normal. Uh, and that was particularly in a certain white matter tract involving the nucleus accumbens. So the point of it is, and this was true before, <laughs> at the beginning of the experiment as well at a year later. The point being, maybe the connections between the nuclei are bad to begin with, and they only get worse with the insult. So this is a concept saying that chronic pain is already predicted in our brains based on our uh, networks. Um, that's why I thought it was really a seminal thing, and it's still out there, and I'm not sure where it's going, but um, it sort of makes sense to me. Okay, so I'm going to give you a case history, and this is the other punchline for pain in general, which is I believe your first obligation is to try and deafferent the system, try to reduce the input. And so here's a case of an 83-year-old woman who had a bad left C8 radiculopathy, came on rather quickly. She went on, had surgery, got the disc removed, got function in her arm back, but I saw her a year later because she wasn't using her left arm. The left arm is all flexed in here and crunched in. And any time you touch it, it would hurt. She wouldn't move it. Now, it wasn't swollen. It wasn't a, you know, a complex regional pain syndrome. It was normal texture. Sensation was impaired in C8. But the process that, along with the physical therapist, is to deafferent, just put lidoderm patches on there. So there's no sensory input coming from the peripheral. If anything, it's just perceived as not there. And with that numbness, the limb has started to mobilize and move, and she got better uh, in of one. But again, an example of one thing that I think you all need to do to try and deafferent the system going in. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about genetics and epigenetics and proteinomics and metabolomics. Anyway, here's a couple of bullet points um, <laughs> that there is stuff here that I'm not sure that I, I'm, I guess I just don't like genetics very much. But uh, they, uh, there are variants that clearly have higher pain thresholds than others. Um, there are sodium channel variants that we know in nature that make a difference. And that uh, now, if you injure a nerve, there is items that are released that, if blocked, can reduce pain and reduce uh, nerve injury. And here's a picture of a grasshopper mouse getting ready to have a scorpion. The scorpion will sting him. It won't hurt the mouse. The venom won't do anything. Same thing true with honey badgers. Same thing with cobras. Honey badgers love cobras. They get bitten, they get stung, they don't experience pain. Or... So there are systems that can modify pain uh, on, a, on a more genetic um, metabolic basis. All right, so, oh, okay, so before we get to the last couple cases, this is just to show that I wasn't a slug. This is an article that just came out in June, all right? And I think this is, again, uh, just kind of blows your mind in a way. So this is an animal model, admittedly. But here's the concept. You can set up an, uh, a uh, chronic pain system with a rat. And lo and behold, if you do that, what you looked at is loads and loads of microglia that show up in the chronic pain system. Microglia, immune system. And not just everywhere, but associated with the nucleus accumbens. Again, the pain system. And what you can do is you can give them tetracycline, and you can block that. And that functionally gets rid of the chronic pain. So my question to you is, should we be treating all low back pain with uh, tetracycline? Do you follow? I think it's a very interesting concept about uh, what goes on with microglia and how we can perhaps modify the system one way or another. All right, I want to read this. It's a very nice literary thing. I heard a shout starting and looked half around. I saw the lion just in the act of springing upon me. I was upon a little height. He caught my shoulder as he sprang, and we both came to the ground below together. Growling horribly close to my ear, he shook me as a terrier does a rat. The shock produced a stupor similar to that which seems to be felt by a mouse after the first shake of the cat. It caused a sort of dreaminess in which there was no sense of pain or feeling or ter of terror though quite conscious of all that was happening. It was like what patients partially under the influence of chloroform described, 
who see all the operation but feel not the knife. The Sheikh annihilated fear and allowed no sense of horror in looking around at the beast. This is a peculiar state, is probably produced by all animals killed by the carnivora, and if so, is a merciful provision by our benevolent creator for the lessening of pain of death. I think it's a beautiful thing that uh, celebrates the role of the periactral ductal gray. Is it not? You know, it, the, the, he had so much inhibition to his shoulder, he was not experiencing the shoulder at all, you know, and he was just at peace. A lot going on there. Now, on a less happy level, I'm going to talk about a couple cases uh, that I've dealt with, and uh, uh, forgive me for personal catharsis, but anyway, let's, let's just kind of go through them. Um, this is a woman, at that time probably in her 30s, who experienced left face pain uh, in March of 1999, had a dental extraction, thinking that that was the cause of her problem, and led to spasms and burning pain in the left upper gum. All the imaging labs, everything was normal. Over the space of two years, she lost 80 pounds because she couldn't swallow, and she would be in our waiting room almost on a weekly basis with the drool cloth underneath her mouth. At some point, she would no longer talk. She would only write, and uh, what she would write is that she was in horrible pain. Um, she had a lot of exotic intervent interventions, clonidine patches, lidocaine infusions, stellate blocks, Went to Florida, had a, some kind of a cryo nerve ablation of part of the trigeminal nerve, went to the University of Iowa, worked with them for years and years on all the appropriate medicines, diclofenac, gabapentin, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I prevailed on poor old uh, Dr. Taylor, who has probably never forgiven me, to put a G-tube in because her weight loss and her inability to take any nutrition became profound. And uh, fortunately, that was reversed. It was removed about a year later. Um, I became, uh, if I wasn't punch drunk by this time, uh, three years into it, um, concerned because she uh, requested that I provide her a prescription for her insurance company to provide her a soundproof environment. What had happened is that she went to get her hearing tested for unknown reasons and uh, had relief of her pain being in the soundproof environment. Um, the insurance company didn't go for it. A little while later, uh, she was telling me about, and uh, handwriting these things out, the recoder, well, I still don't know what the recoder was, is puncturing my right side. And I said, well, this is getting very, very bad. And it turns out in pain, as pediatricians will tell you over and over again, and, and just in care of people, there's always a folly I do. You know, there's a, a, the, the foolishness of two that uh, the husband, poor guy, hung in there with this woman who was totally disabled, you know, from her uh, problem, and he uh, unexpectedly died in a motor vehicle accident. The family then forcibly put her into the psychiatric ward. I, ward. I lost sight of her for a couple of years, and uh, I saw her kind of in passing, with great trepidation, and she smiled, and she said, he's okay, he's not having any pain. And uh, she came and saw me last year and asked if I should, she should have a dental procedure, and I, <laughs> I told her no. Um, but I think, you know, this is a case history that shows how bizarre pain problems are and how uh, they're not to be trivialized at all. So this is a different story. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a young woman uh, who, um, in high school, started having pain problems, knee problems, headache problems, not, un not uncommon. Uh, but she had a little wrinkle to her in that she was a fighter. There was, she would get into fights in high school. Uh, she had a suicide attempt, not clear as to any kind of drug use at that time, but really never was big into drugs. Uh, CT of the head, all this kind of, she had clear-cut menstrual migraines then in 1996. Um, had a lot of stressors in her life, but uh, started getting reflux after, a, during a pregnancy, but had a successful delivery, and the reflux was bad enough, and you question this, you question this, she had a nissen fundal plication. 
I got to see her again because of menstrual migraines, and that was not a big problem. We could take care of that. 2002, Creighton University got involved, and they took down her Nissen fundal plication and gave her the term of duodenal dysmotility. Um, in 2004, I saw her again just with regards to menstrual migraines, which again were never hard to manage, um, but her GI problem had become profound, and of course it's always hard. You have migraines, you always worry about <laughs> the migraines causing the nausea and vomiting as opposed to the GI problem. But uh, it had a very peculiar pattern of always going to T10 in her back, and she would howl with pain back here, and so then the term was uh, visceral hyperalgesia from different universities. And of course, she lives around here, so we were still involved in her care. And she was miserable, so there was another suicide attempt in 2005. Um, and I want to just pause about suicides in the sense that there's a lot of interest in suicides as being a deficiency of pleasure. Again, the nucleus accumbens. The, uh, Anyway, that's a very rich area of research, and, and so this woman certainly had it, uh, that the absence of any relief, and I'm sorry I gave you the punchline here, but look at the situation. Four years, 28 admissions, 28 admissions, and the same thing every time. She'd get a little bit constipated, be in howling pain, brought into the emergency room, given IV fluids, eventually the pain, and high white cells, and be resolved in a few days. Uh, multiple laparotomies, on and on and on, and uh, finally she succeeded in her suicide attempt in 2014. So, um, not pain problems are not to be made light of. Um, so, my thoughts about this is chronic pain is certainly in the brain. I think that uh, being able to understand what goes on in the brain uh, in that particular individual is is key, and there may be signatures out there that we can work with in the future. We don't have a good handle on catastrophizing. We all know what that means, right? You have the person that says, oh, this is the worst thing in the world. Well, it's not. You know, it, it just stubs your toe or something like that. You know, how people catastrophize, we don't understand that phenomenon, and trying to get a handle on that would be good. And I mentioned about the reward deficiency in suicide. Um, I mentioned about the microglia and the immune role, and maybe we were doing something off there. Um, clearly a dangerous problem, but I uh, got to the punchline here, two arrows. So what does the two arrows mean? So this is Buddha from 1,500 years BC saying that all pain is a function of two arrows. You have the first arrow, which pierces, and then it's your relationship with that pain is the second arrow. I think it was profound, it's true. How you relate to that experience, which is going to come into your brain, is uh, fundamental. So, uh, summary, chronic pain, aberrant, excessive messaging, either from the periphery or centrally, without suitable inhibitory control. Multiple sites go wrong, but it can reconstitute. You want a deafferent and calm, excessive firing, and that's what all the drugs are about, but don't ignore just trying to put lidoderm on. Um, <clears throat> inflammatory control may be a future area that we have to work on, and there may be roles to work on the whole brain connectome. That's what uh, um, trans cranial magnetic stimulation is all about. So that's it. I think I've beat the time limit, and uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to uh, entertain them, but I don't promise any answers. And I forgot to say thank you to Emily Erickson for getting me references, and Tim Hextra for helping me with uh, PowerPoint, and Diarlitz for even setting this up. So, there you go. Anything? Going once, going twice. Going twice. <laughs> Certainly somebody back row has something to say, right? Jack? Well, I, I saw a patient yesterday uh, that did have transcranial uh, magnet stimulation. He'd been chronically depressed. His depression was gone. Right. But he was, I think, a bipolar patient, and he looked like he was hypomanic to 
me. I, I don't yeah. know whether anybody else has had that uh, experience or not, but I saw it as a little bit worrisome. Right. Yeah, you're playing with fire. Right. Yeah, you definitely are. Oh, well, I mean, again, yeah, we don't know what we're doing with that. And I, it's not controlled. You have no idea what currents you're giving or anything of that sort. But the concept of trying to control the connectome or trying to control the network within the brain, God knows what you can do about the fibers. You know, you got a blast injury and, and there's axial deviation of the fibers. How they repair, we have no idea. And whether you can do anything to help them repair is just beyond me, at least at this time. Yeah. Uh, if, if so, if pain is an abstraction, can you use something more like hypnosis or, uh, or something to just bypass any kind of... Is that yeah, right? but actually, well, that's uh, like transcranial magnetic stimulation. I mean, I think what you do with hypnosis and what you do with meditation is you try to direct the uh, networks that are operative at one time to a different place you know, get off of the one network that's obsessing about pain and get it into a different place. But uh, it does, hypnosis and meditation are both uh, used for chronic pain problems. No. <laughs> but conceptually, it's the right thing to do, I think. All right, well, thank you very much. Have a good day.